Well, welcome everyone to our first town hall discussion about research and the um, Black families and communities in the Kansas City area. Many of you may have attended the Thursday, June 17th kickoff session for the national conversation, and we thought it would be good to have a local conversation. So as, as you noted, we are recording this. If you would prefer not to be recorded, please feel free to leave, but I will tell you that we are recording this in order to share the information with our KU Cancer Center Clinical Trial Office. They had specifically wanted to get additional information. Uh, the format for tonight is we'll start out with Jill Peltzer, uh, a nurse researcher from KU School of Nursing and a friend of Pivot. And she will share a little bit about the previous presentation and then Broderick Crawford and Crystal Lumpkins will facilitate a conversation. And this really is about a, a conversation. And so we're hoping that you all will participate in it as well as um, learn a little bit and help us learn as well. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand the, the baton off to Jill to kick off the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Hope. I am going to share my screen. Um, I took some notes from the panel discussion that I wanted to share. So welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you this evening and talk about um, cancer during the inaugural National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week. The FDA Oncology Center of Excellence um, launched this inaugural um, National Black Family Cancer Awareness Week in accordance with the very first presidential executive order that was signed to advance racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And they chose June with intention to align with Juneteenth particularly um, in hope that the time of launching this, that Juneteenth would be established as a national holiday, and it has been, um, and also with Men's Health Month and National Cancer Survivor Day. One of the um, polls that they did during the panel was about when polled, what do you think is the number one reason African Americans don't participate in clinical trials? And 59% of those who participated said that past unethical treatment and influenced decisions to participate in clinical trials. And 39% said that African Americans are not asked to participate in clinical trials. So I think this really emphasizes the rest of the panel discussion that I think is particularly important for our clinicians, researchers, clinical trial office team, and the rest of our KUMC community. We need to do a better job of identifying, recognizing, and addressing the barriers that impact um, African-American families in deciding and having the option to participate in clinical trials. So here are some of the key takeaways that I took from the panel. Okay, there, sorry. Um, when community involvement is critical to building education and prevention approaches that will be effective. And one of the panelists provided a really great example that if we were interested in providing education to Latinas about cervical cancer prevention, that there might be messaging where there's four generations of women in the kitchen um, talking about reasons for cervical cancer and ways that, um, that we know are effective in preventing. So context is really important and we need to involve community to build appropriate education and prevention approaches. Yeah, they also talked about science as bilingual and scientists do not do a good job translating for the public. 
Um, we, I think these are conversations that are not new to those of us who are here this evening. We know that there is a tremendous gap in how we are disseminating information, to whom we're disseminating information, and the language that we're using. And we need to do a better job of learning how to communicate. And we can partner with our community advocates so that we can learn from them the best um, methods of translating and disseminating information to the community. Academic centers are often located in communities that have been historically overlooked, yet have a low percentage of racially and ethnic, ethnically participation in clinical trials, um, and in particular in early phase clinical trials. So again, more for our medical center colleagues who are on the call this evening, what are ways that we can um, ensure participation? How do we um, make sure that individuals can access care in the health system? And then how are we engaging them in conversations about clinical trials? The key takeaway that I heard over and over again was that we have to invest in the community. And this again is not new for those of us who are on the call this evening, but we hear from community members when scientists don't have a, gra a grant, they're gone. So they come in, we come in and complete a project over a couple of years and then we leave. We need to invest in the community. We need different models that um, can be used to maintain consistent presence in the community. We need to look at different funding mechanisms that can help us maintain consistent presence in the community um, so that we're not project-based and temporary. We also need to make sure that we are trained by the community and how to be effective community partners. Um, we can't assume that we know how to engage in the community. And so it really takes a collaborative um, partnership where we are, where we have bi-directional um, education and training. We can provide education about research and health system, and then we can learn about how to be good um, uh, community members um, with our other community organizations. And scientists need to be dutiful in translating science to local policy. So we can't stop at completing a project um, and even translating to the clinical setting. How do we translate science to positively impact local policy in collaboration with leaders and community members. Those were my key takeaways. I will be interested to hear from Crystal and Broderick, maybe some of the key takeaways that they have from the panel. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Crystal and Broderick to um, um, share um, their perspectives I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. I forgot I had another slide. Um, the onus is on physicians and other health professionals to engage patients in discussions about clinical trials. So I've kind of moved from what, how we need to be in the community to once we're in um, the healthcare setting. So physicians and other health professionals need to provide the opportunity for individuals to participate in clinical trials use culturally informed strategies to provide information about clinical trials and to ensure that patients are able to make informed decisions about clinical trials. So now we are ready to um, open up the conversation. So Crystal and Broderick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think you were gonna tag team on answering these four questions and then um, ask our audience. Absolutely. So Jill, thank you again for your summary and the presentation that you have provided. Uh, thank you again to Hope and Sarah for all that you do with Pivot. It is certainly an honor for me to be with you all here tonight. 
Uh, yes, uh, Crystal and I are going to uh, address each of these four questions, but I think before we do that, let me just say that I think a lot of the information that has been provided via, via the national conversation doesn't always hit home. And I'm hoping and I want to share with our audience that we want this to be a conversation, uh, not just uh, Crystal and I talking about our perspectives and opinions, but we certainly want to hear from you. We want to hear your, your thoughts, your concerns, and, and in many ways, it's feedback and advice. So that being said, Crystal, the mic is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Broderick. Um, as Broderick said, I, I really appreciate being a part of this conversation. Uh, and thank you to Sarah, Jill, um, and Hope um, for this opportunity. Um, this national discussion is only the, the what I say, the starting point. Uh, and so it was really good. I thought it was a, a very robust discussion. But as we know, in 90 minutes, you can't cover everything. But um, saying that, um, I think this is a, a, an excellent platform for us to dig down deeper um, and to see how we can take this national discussion and apply it here um, locally and even regionally. So uh, the first question uh, that you see here is, what surprised you, if anything, from the national discuss uh, discussion? Uh, and so I know Broderick, um, I just wanted to ask you um, so that we can just start the ball rolling here. Um, were there any things that surprised you about um, the national discussion? So, so, Crystal, I would say that not necessarily anything, quote unquote, surprising. I mean, most of the information that was presented, we already knew. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is very clear, it's very factual that people of color have not participated uh, in a way that is often meaningful. It's often in participation when you think about some of the uh, tragedies and, and uh, things that have happened as it relates to uh, folks of color. Uh, with uh, clinical trials and with cancer for that matter. Uh, the other piece that I would say that often is not often touched on is, yes, we wanna have a discussion, but rather than just a discussion, I, pref I have a preference of seeing action. And so I did not see anything laid out as to what individuals actually could do. So what, what are the tasks? What are we gonna do next? What are the next steps? that we need to do to not change the conversation, but change the activity, because that's what needs to change. The activity needs to change. So we know, for example, that African-American women, women have the worst breast cancer rates and mortalities and all of those things. So what are we gonna do about it? Are we gonna continue to talk? Or are we gonna put some action in place? We know that prostate cancer uh, by and large affects African-American men more, uh, negatively than their white counterparts. So we're gonna keep talking or we're gonna do something. So again, uh, those are my initial comments and uh, certainly we would invite the audience uh, to weigh in. You can either raise your hand or just take yourself off mute, but we certainly want to hear some feedback from you all about the cancer conversation on a national level. So thank you, Broderick, uh, for uh, those comments. And as we are waiting for those comments or questions to come in, I will also add in this, that um, while you were uh, commenting so rightly about just the actionable steps, I was also looking at um, the social determinants of health because uh, that's, you know, as a researcher, that's some of the things that um, when I'm looking at barriers and what Jill mentioned is, um, how uh, someone mentioned on the call that the steps, getting in the steps, the 20,000 steps or 10,000 steps, but maybe someone doesn't have, you know, access or uh, is, is uh, as far as even being able to walk, those types of things. And so those were some of the things that came to mind. Um, how do we arm people or equip people to make actionable uh, changes? Um, so great. I think I saw something. Was there a comment? Of... Yes, okay. Pastor, Carter, Pastor Carter. And actually, Pastor Carter, you, you did put a comment in the chat. I'd like for you to go ahead and bring yourself off mute and 
Tell us why that's a, a concern for you of yours. Well, Broderick, I think you drove the point home. I was just kind of dittoing what you were saying. If we don't propose action steps to go with the information that we are already all aware of, if we don't come up with some step one, step two, step three, whatever, some actionable items, then we're just, we're going to keep having this conversation every 10 or 15 years or every time some kind of uh, health crisis comes up and it's just going to continue to illuminate that there have not been any really actionable uh, steps taken to begin. And we're not going to eradicate it overnight, but to at least begin the process of decreasing those things that we know. And so the action steps, or at least a recommendation, let's start here. And there were no action items or recommendations uh, included. And one of the things um, I saw, the, we'll get to this question that um, has come up about how do researchers typically recruit patients. But one of the things I just wanted to, um, to piggyback off of what you just said, uh, Pastor Carter and Broderick, um, as far as those actionable steps, and what I think was uh, reflected in the national discussion was community involvement. I know we say community involvement, community engagement, but are we truly involving those people? And, and that's why, again, this is what my view as far as being a community-based participatory researcher, that um, many times researchers are engaging with the community, uh, but is coming from a top-down approach and it's not truly um, including those community members or those patients for that matter in all phases of the process. And so you have this um, where people are engaging, you know, the community um, and it's coming from the perspective of the researcher. And, and we see these things um, uh, essentially uh, this cycle that is repeating. So Broderick, I wanted to make sure I give you an um, opportunity to respond as well. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to respond to Alex's question yes. uh, about how uh, patients are recruited. And so oftentimes, if there is no real connection to the community, there is the recruitment is not where it needs to be. Uh, there are many cases where clinical trials currently fail to meet their minority recruitment numbers because they don't have access or they don't have relationships. So oftentimes, uh, as you know, as we here at Pivot have worked with our researchers to become more engaged in the community outside of what they need for a particular clinical trial or project. So how are you engaging with the very folks that you want to do research with? Do you know where their families live? Do you know where they uh, go to church? Do you know where they go to, to the grocery store if they have a grocery store? So for example, in many of our communities, there are food deserts. Are you aware of these other social determinants that happen, that occur in the day-to-day -day, day -day lives of these proposed or, or potential pa uh, patients for your trial when you don't have any engagement with them? And I think that's a problem because it, without relationship, folks are not gonna wanna engage with you. You can, in many cases, offer money or other different types of incentives, but unless it's something that's I'm on my deathbed, I really don't want to hear what you're saying, or I don't want to participate because I don't have a relationship with you. And so many, in many cases, what often occurs is researchers will reach out to folks like many of the folks on, on this call today. So Angela Williams, uh, Dola, uh, uh, Christine Darnell, Pastor Carter, uh, Tanya, and, and so they, and D, they'll look for folks like that to try to connect to the community but even with that, if you still haven't developed a relationship with me, I'm not necessarily going to be huggy, hug, you know, all huggy with you, like kumbaya, because I don't really, why do you need me now? And then the second piece of that is even when you want to connect with me, how do you identify community? In many of our academic institutions, community is identified by the folks that work at the institution and not folks that are actually living in the community. Uh, the, there was a slide that talked about uh, many of our uh, academic institutions in the communities that are the most impoverished. So, for example, KU is in Wyandotte County, which has had one of the worst, the worst health rankings 
in the state of Kansas since 2008. I love most of my KU colleagues and researchers, but what has KU said that they're gonna do to change that? What is the public announcement from leadership at KU to say, this is a travesty and we wanna do something about it. Women in, 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 in Kansas have had breast cancer in the worst race for years. It's just now that all of a sudden we want to do something about it. And so it's those kinds of activities. And I'm going to shut up because you can tell I can get a little passionate about this, but it makes no sense to me. It makes no sense why we continue to placate one another. Oh, yes, we're doing this. And oh, yes, we're doing that. But yet the rates are still staying the same or getting worse. Absolutely. And Broderick, um, you raised, you know, some very important uh, points and it is the relationship building. Um, and the, you know, and I will say with my experience, when I first uh, started, you know, the research um, with African-Americans, you can see I'm African-American um, in the community uh, was very much so um, when I went out uh trying to start building relationships, it was hard, it was difficult because of previous times where researchers um, had uh, gone into the community uh, and said, I have to do a research project and they're gone. It, it only lasted the, the grant, the life of the grant. And so we know it's very important for uh, well, like pivot, um, training um, and, and having those relationships, building those relationships where there is a common and shared interest um, because you know we're in the dot um, and we have a true investment in um, you know Wyandotte County. And so um, I know that everyone has heard this expression, I believe that um, it's not just a sprint, it's a journey. And so it is you know the time, time and investment is so key. Um, and as a former journalist, I remember, so I promise I'm not going off on a tangent here, but um, <laughs> when reaching out to individuals about um, what is in it for me. And so yeah. I think all of us, we have to look at, you know, researchers, we're in this so that should be that we're trying to address these uh, cancer disparities and then community members, patients, we... <laughs> There is a, you know, there's a desperate need to address these gaps and health disparities, uh, and so um, I think there was a also another. So yeah, yes, yeah. There's a couple of comments. So one, I want to respond to Dr. Jensen, who is our fearless leader. Who without him, we would not be able to do Absolutely. the things that yes. we do. Uh, and so we want to appreciate and applaud the efforts that Dr. Jensen has done Absolutely. with the Cancer Center. But then uh, he spoke about FaithWorks, which is an organization you and I might have a little relationship with. Yes. But even when FaithWorks was initially formed, you as a researcher, it took you, if I'm not mistaken, two, three years before even yourself as an African-American researcher really had right. to get to the position that you have today. Yes. Uh, and then Mary Green uh, made a comment. I want to ask her to unmic and share a little bit about her concern that she shared in the chat. Mary. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my concern is this often African Americans do not participate in research because of their past treatment by those in medical fields, such as pharmacists doctors or other researchers who have came into the community and mainly used us as guinea pigs and then left. And there is no follow through or they have been mistreated or talked to like they should be glad to get this. And that's the wrong way to come off to people. And truthfully, I'm interested in all the help we can get, but totally I don't trust researchers or some uh, doctors because of how I've seen them give wrong medication to people and they know it. I just had an experience where medication was given to me to cure one thing. And, um, but for some reason, I never went and got it or they didn't give me the prescription in my hand. Then later I get a message from my insurance company that said this medication is not even rec uh, recommended by the FDA and it's highly uh, poisonous to 
uh, seniors and should not be used. But then the doctor's office called and asked me, was I taking their medicine? I said, no, I got bad information on it and my insurance company will not pay for it. And their response was, well, that's okay. It's not that high. You could pay for it. Uh, these are the things that happens to make pe the wave of a red flag for people uh, of African American um, descent because we're trying to figure do you really care? Do you want me to get help? Are you going to think enough of my participation to pursue steps that's going to help me help communicate with Afri other African Americans that there is help out there and that? We could beat this if we do this. I just don't want you coming in, doing an experiment and leaving, you know? And so for me as a whole, you say medication, uh, participating in research and a flag goes up because I'm wondering exactly what is the hidden reason for the research? And I think until we're able to communicate to people exactly what we're doing and not make this a project that lasts six weeks or 12 weeks and run away and not follow through, you will not have a lot of African-Americans participating. So that is so awesome. Yes, go ahead. Someone else wanted to speak, yes. Oh, I, you know, I, first I want to say I am sorry that that has happened to you, um, Elder Green, that you have um, experienced that. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure where that occurred, but what um, I will say is that um, at KU, um, we are very intentional about uh, addressing those things. Uh, and myself, as um, a researcher and have engaged with the community, uh, really need individuals like you um, to be in those, uh, in the capacity of, uh, of addressing things uh, such as that. Um, and so those experiences are real. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, some of these things um, have occurred. Uh, um, but should not be occurring, um, you know, because one of the the uh, the poll I saw as far as unethical treatments and those types of things, these have been things that have been perpetuated um, and compounded. And a lot of the good things that are happening, um, it, it seems that those have been pushed aside. So what am I saying? I am saying that um, the process that I'm involved in is being very transparent um, and, and uh, hoping that if there are uh, certain, you, you talked about medication, um, I think that you, know, you were put on or, or so forth. Um, and again, I can't speak to specifically, you know, your specific, um, your process that you went through, um, but there should have been uh, something in place where you were informed. And so that's very unfortunate, um, but, uh, Broderick, I don't know if you had any other. No, no, I don't have anything else, but there's another comment. And again, what you will see me do is I'm going to, since I know a good majority of the folks on this call, I'm going to speak, uh, continue to call folks out. So Dola, you put a uh, comment in the chat. So I'd like for you to unmike and give some insight on your comment and why you feel the way that you do. So I think, um... Yeah, go back to what I said, but I, I think so the challenge is, or one of the challenges is I know that um, there is a patient navigator, and this is uh, as related to breast cancer, there's a patient navigator at the Unified Government Health Department, but there is a disconnect between the work that she does, in my opinion, and the work that has been done with KU, like there's not there's not a there, or I have not seen or been able to engage uh, people to partner with what is going on there. I also think that the people that she serves are um, mostly uninsured, I think. And so they are not in spaces like this and probably more of the ones who are affected by not having access, right? That's what we're talking about, to the different services that are 
available. And so the very people we're talking about are not at the table um, at the community level. And then the people who are providing the services are not even talking to each other. So, you know, there's that, that's one challenge that I think is a big challenge. Thank you so much, Dola. And, and I, I think you're absolutely correct. And I think Hope has already indicated she wants to reach out to you to get, you know, a little more insight and information. Uh, connecting the dots, uh, as, as we, we say here in the dot, is, is so very important. And when you have all of the different entities, I, I share with my great KU colleagues that community doesn't understand that there's a hospital system, that there's a cancer system, that there's a med center system, that there's a nursing system, there's a health professional system. All community hears is KU. Mm -hmm. Or there's a system in Lawrence, or there's a system in Wichita. KU with KU. And so how do we better connect the dots, not only internally at KU, but then how do we communicate that? I, I, I work very closely with a good friend of mine, Ryan Spaulding, and, and how are we changing the narrative with what's being said and what's understood about KU in this community? And those are things that are important questions because people, again, the person, and I'm pointing right up the street on 7th in Minnesota, when you say KU, it's going to be one KU. It's not going to be four or five different entities. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, another friend of mine, uh, Tanya, is if she would weigh in on that particular perspective. So what you so what you're saying is having the different systems. You mean, Roderick? Yes. Yes. Okay. So right. Um, you're exactly right. There. Uh, KU one system, but there are many different broken out divisions within that system that people don't, you know, unless you have cancer, you're not really concerned about the cancer center or the, you know, certain things in the Well Women's Clinic and the other things. So I don't really know how to educate those people that have that, that don't have insurance to tell them about some of the other things and some of the questions that they can ask. Maybe perhaps, I don't know um, how to connect them with different systems other than a navigator. Um, but what I can say is uh, um, questionnaires, asking them things, you know, when they check in, if they would be interested in this or that, or are they aware of this or do they have any questions? And so while they're sitting and waiting, maybe perhaps, um, doing a little bit of, of that to kind of help them along in the process to see things that they can't naturally see. Thank you so much, Tanya, and I appreciate your, your input. And again, this is what we need. We need input from the community. So Crystal, I'll turn it back over to you and let you take us to the next question, uh, if, if you will. I have a quick comment, Broderick. Oh, absolutely, Dr. Solano, please do. Okay, I something being in the recruiting side, something that just called my attention and is one of the findings that surprised me is that uh, the incentives, that we are using incentives to recruit them. And many of the people that we work with, they ask me, okay, if you're giving me something, if you're paying me to do this, it's because I am at risk. So there is an implicit, um, and it's a, an interesting finding. And, and now same thing is happening with the testing and same thing is happening with the vaccine. If you are giving me so many incentives, what is the risk? You know, what is what you're not telling me? Because it, and the higher the reward and the higher the incentive, the more, let's say, paranoid the people become and it has been an interesting um, finding, even though we uh, use words as compensating you for your time, it's a compensation. It is interesting, the perception that we are buying something. So just a comment. 
No, yes, thank you. And actually, Broderick and I have actually, you know, we're on another research team together and we've talked about some of these things. And so, um, you know, this incentivizing behavior um, and, you know, what, and again, Broderick, you may have a, another comment here about this, but I think when we look at that um, compensation for uh, the testing or the screening, um, that it should be uh, something that would, uh, an individual could naturally, that would be helpful, such as covering the cost of, you know, the screening, uh, not something such as, you know, and again, this may be a little bit, not exaggerated, but thousands of dollars, for instance, but if it's a clinical trial, that's, that's something different. Um, and so this is something, yes, that we are actually, you know, this conversation, uh, as you know, this is the COVID-19 situation where there are tuition dollars and, and those types of things. So- well, and, um, and Crystal, no. I can share if you, if you don't mind. So right now I've been asked to join a team here locally that is going to now begin to recruit individuals that are not vaccinated, that are of minority and are between 18 and 29. So again, the whole incentive question that, that, that Manuel brought up is, is very key. So how do we ap ap appropriately uh, compensate folks for their time, but mm -hmm. yet not getting them to the point where they're reaching, okay, why are you throwing whatever this X number of yes. dollars at me mm -hmm. just to do this for something I already have an issue with? Right. And, and so that conversation is, is absolutely uh, needed. And actually, as we start this trial, which is actually going to be here in a few days, I, I will be reaching out to several of you for your input. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind, I think we have two other comments in the chat that we should probably go to. So Deepak has put something in, and we certainly want to uh, give her the opportunity, and then Angela Williams. So we'll go to D first, and then Angela. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be able to be here this evening. Um, the Black Fam Cam uh, initiative was really interesting to me. It was very good to see so many African American doctors on the panel and and uh, all over the country and and hearing their uh, different the things that they have uh, done and and the research that they've done. A couple of things stood out to me uh, from the first half of their discussion that I think are some things that kind of is going to touch on the next question. So. Uh, forgive me for- No, go right ahead, ahead. go right ahead. ahead. This is open okay. discussion. Yeah, yes. please do. Okay, some things that I think we could implement here in, in our area. Um, one of the panel members was a uh, retired uh, professional sports player. And he was saying how uh, using the the people in, the, in, in professional sports to put out different messages and things like that to the community was one of the ways that they were able to help people uh, get involved in clinical trials and some screenings. And so, you know, we've got, we've got the Royals, we've got Chiefs Kingdom, you know, maybe there's something we could do to help partnership with them to help uh, get reach, you know, a different niche in the community uh, with people to help them to see the benefits of clinical trials and, and uh, some screenings that could be done. Um, one of the other things that I thought was very interesting was uh, talking about the bilingual science. Um, that was something that, oh, what, what is her name? Jill, <laughs> that brought out it at the beginning in her um, PowerPoint. Um, and so they actually brought in community members to work with doctors to train the doctors on how to communicate with people in the community rather than being the other way around. Because a lot of times, it is something we talk about in Pivot all the time, you know, uh, scientists, researchers, doctors, sometimes they can get in that language that's just, a, you know, over our head, you know, and, and so it makes it difficult and challenging to, to really help people understand what they're actually getting involved in. And so I think that is an initiative, is something that we could start just to very practical things um, that I, I think that we could uh, definitely start off in. And then um, I, I wrote later in the chat, yes, relationships <laughs> um, about the Susan Coleman program. So when I was diagnosed, I did not, I was uninsured. 
And so uh, I was living in Wichita at the time, but I went to um, the health department and they signed me up with the Susan Coleman uh, Breast Cancer and Ovarian Cancer Screening Program, and it was covered for free. And so I don't know then from that point, there were some, uh, my file was flagged and that sent me to different, um, the cancer center there in Wichita and also a particular breast surgeon that was there in Wichita that all worked with uninsured people. And so, it, so it's something in their you know, system where they have it set up to where uninsured people get directed you know, in the right places so that they can still get good care. I had the top surgeon and also one of the top cancer um, doctors in, in the area. Um, even though I was uninsured. So um, that's something that we could look into as well. Those um, programs are really good. Somebody talked, yeah, the early detection works. That was the, um, the program that I uh, was able to get my screening through. That is outstanding. That is great information. Absolutely. Angela. I do. Can I just say something to sure, sure, uh, sure. just with, uh, in response to D? So thank you so much for those. And I'll just quickly say that I know that um, our communication marketing um, has done some collaboration with Royals uh, Chiefs. And in fact, I was just at Top Golf yesterday, and I saw the KU. Um, there was a sticker on the table. Um, but but what you're saying though is that clinical trial piece. So. I think that is uh, excellent. So thank you, and also for sharing your uh, your experiences too. So Angela, so that's a good that's oh. a good something to put a pin in. So Dr. Crystal Lumpkins at Top Golf. Hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Angela. Talk about right. my score, but that's okay. <laughs> you no, know, uh, it was just in follow up to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Something that uh, you heard or you didn't know. I may be misquoting, but in attending the meeting, I was listening and. I didn't know that there in, I guess for me is messaging and what you hear and the intent of what was said. And so when it was said that you would get better treatment or higher quality of care, if you were seeing a doctor that is connected to a clinical trial, um, I heard that. Yes, I mean, uh, the on Friday when they were speaking and I'm saying, how does one know to go in and ask that question? Not to say that if your doctor is not involved in a clinical trial, you won't get great care, but it takes you back to would my outcome or my circumstances be different if I was this, with a doctor that was involved in a clinical trial. So I'm going to ask so, either Dr. Jansen or Hope to respond to that, either one of you. And then I got another part too, but go ahead. Sure. Sure. So, um, uh, thanks, uh, Broderick, and, and thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Williams, for that uh, question. I, you know, it's, um, I, I think that statement comes from studies which have shown that patients that are enrolled on clinical trials, even if they don't get the, the new treatment, the new drug, or, or whatever, actually turn out to um, have better outcomes than patients in the community uh, that are receiving the same standard of care that they're uh, getting. And um, that may seem a, a little um, you know, puzzling, but the, the reason for that is that when a patient is, is enrolled in a clinical trial, it's one of the, uh, it's a way to basically guarantee that you are absolutely getting the, um, the known standard of care at the time and that there's no alteration in that, um, in that standard of, of care. Um, because there's all kinds of, of people that are checking to make sure that, um, say like if, if, um, you know, if, if Mrs. Uh, Smith missed her appointment on Thursday, somebody is calling her up and finding out what the issues are and, and trying to make sure that, um, you know, she stays on track in terms of 
of her next chemotherapy or next x-ray exam or, or something like that. So it's, it, um, I, I think most of that just, just relates to that. And then, um, you know, the, the other part is that it is quite likely that uh, a physician that is participating actively in clinical trials for their patients is, is very much um, up to speed on kind of what the latest therapeutic approaches are and that they're very in, invested and interested in, in keeping up with the literature. And, you know, they're not just practicing kind of the same way that they were practicing, you know, three to five years ago. And, Dr. Jason, would a person who is not in a clinical trial still get that same type of care? No. Well, but potentially, but, but, like the, the first point I'm, I, I was making is that um, a, a clinical trial, um, even for patients that don't get the new therapy, is mm -hmm. such a rigid process okay. that it ensures that you're getting the absolute known standard of care uh, at, at the time. And like, it, it's not just like one physician who's trying to keep track of that. It's it's that physician plus the research nurse uh, plus the data uh, coordinator because they're all monitoring and making sure that you know everybody's making their appointment and, and getting the um, the therapy that is prescribed in the in the trial. So it's like a whole bunch of people kind of checking on one another and making sure that everything gets done. So in that case, Dr. Jensen, when you have the clinical trial physician versus the non-clinical trial. The clinical trial physician has more hands on deck, if you will, to make sure that they're tracking and following where a regular PCP not in a clinical trial is subject to what he has available in his or her office. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's an appropriate point to make, uh, Roderick, is in that uh, physicians that have access to clinical trials generally have a, um, more... Um, kind of supportive infrastructure to help them manage the patients. Mm. And, you know, it, it just, that, that just makes sense. Um, so, you know, that's, I think that's where that comes from. Awesome. Hope, it looks like you wanted to respond. Please do. I would love just to add in, I think that second point that Dr. Jensen also made about um, really being up to date we often hear from our Masonic Cancer Alliance physicians who say that participating in clinical trials makes them a better physician every day. And so one of the things that Dr. Jensen mentioned was that you have the people getting the, the new treatment or, or the old treatment plus something new. I mean, it depends on the trial. And you have what we consider the standard of care. That's what they're comparing it to, to someone who's getting the standard of care. So those doctors have to read what the standard of care is and follow that to the, to the, to the T. And so they, they read it every day. And, and so even if a patient doesn't get involved in the trial, that doctor remembers what that standard of care is because they've read it in the clinical trial and they have to follow it with other patients. To your question also, Angela, how do you find a doctor involved in a clinical trial? Some of the ways that I do that is um, for friends or family who don't live in Kansas City but are wanting care, I look on the, the websites of those locations and I look to see if they're partnering with a clinical trial network of some kind or if they're partnering with an academic medical center. If it is an academic medical center, more than likely their office is participating in trials. But to really know whether or not that physician is, is participating in trial gets a little harder to find. And, and I could describe no, some ways, but it's a lot harder to find. And it, it may mean calling and asking the office. And it's okay as, as, as healthcare consumers, we are, are you know, investing in our care and we have the right to call and ask and even interview the staff about those sort of things prior to making the appointment. Yeah, but what I was 
And I appreciate that hope, but I guess I was kind of thinking, you know, prior to me participating in that uh, webinar, how does one know to even ask that question? Right, yeah, like, you right, know, it's not even in the head, right? I, you know, I, you know, like I've shared with several of you before, my husband is an eight year bladder cancer survivor. I've never even thought to even ask that question. You know, we just went along with what the doctor was saying. Now, by the grace, he's well, but I didn't know. So how do you know all that? How would one, you know, the average person just know to do that if they're not involved in the system? And so this is what Peggy Johnson. Boy, she has hit, she's hit it on the head that there simply has to be more education about clinical trials. My first question to my oncologist was, is there a clinical trial for my kind of breast cancer? And he, at that point, had already looked and knew that there wasn't. But there has to be more public education. And I know KU's trying to do this, but mm -hmm. we among ourselves and in our communities have to be telling people what clinical trials are and exactly how Dr. Jensen explained it as to what the benefit's gonna be. Even if you don't get the trial drug, you get better care. And so this is where we have to, as Hope's saying, we have to connect and educate what the resources are. And not all communities have clinical trials, have access to community, uh, uh, to clinical trials, but it's one of the things that we have to continue to just hit on is ask about clinical trials, ask about clinical trials, because our daughter someday may need, may need care, and the care will be given better because somebody participated in a clinical trial. Pay it forward. Thank you so much, Peggy. I uh, appreciate your input and your insight and your experience. You know, we love to hear from you. Tanya, you had your hand raised. You have a question or a comment? Yes, I have more of a comment. And my comment was uh, when I first visited my oncologist and my chance of reoccurrence <clears throat> was a number that was unacceptable to me. I, and that's when I said, okay, this isn't going to work. So what else? How can we re make that number smaller? And then I didn't even know what a clinical trial study was. That's when that conversation started because I was so angry about the, the high number of uh, life expectancy for myself. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. Let's figure something else out. And they introduced a clinical trial study. I had no idea what a clinical, originally, I didn't know what it was, but I was then put on one. And so I'm, I'm forever grateful that I was. That's my comment. Outstanding. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, my good friend, Crystal, I, I think I'm going to turn things back over to you. <laughs> Okay, wow, we've been having a very rich discussion, uh, 623. Um, I wanted to, I know we have a few more questions, but you know, because this is a community forum, Hope actually had an excellent question, you know, as we're looking at these clinical trials. And as Peggy, you mentioned education. So, um, oh, I think uh, maybe there was a response to this. I'm trying, you all trying to read the chat and and also facilitate at the same time. But, um, but that's something that you know, we want to ask, how do we educate? I think I know where it is um, absolutely having advocates um, and individuals uh, that are uh, training us and are helping to educate and going into those spaces, such as you know, I work with faith-based uh, communities and, um, and going to faith-based communities and having educational programs, in fact, um, I will say that's something I feel very fortunate that have been able to work with faith communities with, um, you know, uh, cancer related genetic uh, counseling and testing. And so that's something that, you know, and we don't see this as I want to say this to everyone as the first conversation. We see this as uh, hopefully, a, you know, a series of conversations that we're having with you, a very important um, entity for for KU, for our community. 
Um, in the last few minutes remaining, um, Roderick, would you, we had four questions. Um, I think we actually covered some yeah, I think of we've them. covered most of what Cover we wanted most to do. Of them. Yeah, I think it more important than questions is hearing feedback from from our audience. And so yes. Pastor Carter has his hand up. So Pastor oh. Carter, please do. Yes, thank you. I guess all I want to say is because I again I know this is this is not something we're going to fix next week, next month, or even next year. But can I offer a Joe lunch meat Willis sausage head <laughs> conclusion? Don't, don't come with none of those I, Mississippi uh, analogies, sir. No, but I say that because, you know, I feel like I'm, of all of the people who are on here, I'm probably the least, um, um, how do you say, equipped. Because you guys are, there are, are healthcare, I'm here because I pastor a church. But, but I care about, and I think we all do care about our community. And what I see, and I think Kay, Kaya Thompson said it earlier, it's about relationships. Here's how we educate people. KU should encourage their doctors to, and, and I'm not saying this because I want people to come to my church. I know that's what it's gonna sound like, but that's not what I'm saying. But I think KU should encourage its doctors, not just the ones who are doing clinical trials, but I mean, just in a general sense to become involved with churches in the communities where the disparities occur and build relationships with those people because those people, should they see them on a fairly regular basis, will begin to, how do you say, I think will we'll, we'll be drawn more to them. There will be more trust built over you. One of the things that I, one of the reasons I got to be a part of the Health Equity Task Force was because uh, Dr. Alan Greiner came to my church prior to this even happening. I mean, two or three years ago, and we built a relationship. I knew him, he knew me. And so that was a trust. And when somebody said they wanted me to consider being on the task force and they mentioned Dr. Greiner, because of our relationship, I, I began to do something that I didn't know anything about because I trusted him. And because I knew my little brother, Broderick, he was a big part of this too. My little brother was there and he was encouraging and about the things that we could begin to do for our communities. And I think the key is to people being involved in situations where they can build relationships beyond our normal concentric circle of contact. Everybody has those people we know, and those are people we hobnob with, but I think we ought to be willing to extend beyond that. As a pastor, I've put myself kind of out there, and I'm uncomfortable many times because I know what I don't know, <laughs> and I know what I do know, which ain't very much, but I know I care about the community, and, and there are opportunities where I can speak and bring a relevance to a situation. And I think that's what we all have to do. It's building relationships and doctors from KU should just start being a part of what's going on in these communities of despair. Uh, and over time, a lot of these issues, even if the doctor is not a clinical doctor, if he has a doctor there, that doctor can introduce the clinical doctor to a church and say, here's a friend of mine who does great work and they're doing a clinical trial. Anybody who has these issues, I really wish you would talk. And because my trust in that doctor, I would listen to his friend. It's, that is it's so small, awesome. But it starts. I'm yes, done. sir. Yes, sir. That is so awesome. And we're about we're about out of time. So I don't. I want to be um, mindful of our time, uh, Chris. I don't know if you want to have any last words, but I was going to swing it over to Hope for us to wrap up and then take it from there. No, the only thing that I will say is that I am so appreciative of this conversation and, and I can tell that everyone has a lot of passion around this. Um, and so we want to keep engaged with you. Uh, and so um, hopefully, and there's been a lot of chatter in the chat. We've had a lot of resources that have been put into the chat. Um, but again, just really appreciate the conversation and honor to be a part of the up uh, here tonight. So thank you, Broderick. Oh. oh.
Take us home, please, ma'am. Well, Crystal and Broderick, thank you. This has been amazing. Uh, I learn something every single time I'm with both of you. And this, of course, is one of those great days. And to the audience, you all have been so gracious with your knowledge and, and really sharing information that I think can make a difference. Uh, and I'm hoping that you will continue this conversation with us. We will definitely continue to, to try to reach out to you. Join our Facebook Masonic, uh, Masonic Cancer Alliance Facebook page where we will make announcements about these sort of of opportunities to talk. I put my email address in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me and share um, additional information or if you wanna to speak to anyone specifically, I'm happy to connect you. It was thrilling to see people from um, Phillipsburg, Kansas with Sandy Kuhlman and the hospice director to um, the Kickapoo Nation represented with Chris Darnell and Tara Lynn from the, the physician from the clinical trial office. And most important, and in addition, all these people from that have experienced from Wichita and, and that many of you now are in Kansas City, of course, Peggy Johnson is from Wichita. So this really has been a statewide conversation. Dee, Tanya, Reverend Carter, all the Pivot members that have participated, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll have a wonderful evening and together we can make a difference and we can prove and give everyone the opportunity to have a equal health and, and a healthy outcome. So thank you. So hope I'm gonna ask one final thing again, thank you mm -hmm. to all, but I see a lot of additional chatter in the chat. So there are requests for different individuals who wanna connect with different people that's on this mm -hmm. call. So I don't know, Sarah, if you could put together a list of all of the email addresses to send to everyone so that those that want to reach out and touch and have further conversations on a one on one basis so that they can do so. So we don't want to uh, deny or negate that opportunity if there, as you all know, I, I love to network. And so it does appear that there is some some interest in folks networking. So if we could get everybody's emails because everyone doesn't know how to capture all the chat stuff. Uh, and Great get idea. that to everyone so that we can connect folks appropriately. Great idea. So please, before you leave, add your email in the chat box and we'll be happy to reach out to you all. So have a wonderful evening, everyone. And we want to give everybody a moment Thank to do you. so before we disconnect. So yeah, yep. give everyone an opportunity to do that. Yep, Sarah will stay on and I'll stay on so, okay. or whoever is in control. <laughs> Ashley, Ashley's got the, she's got the, the, I, the I will leave it open. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a great, great Thank evening. You. Take care. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.